in this sanctuary. I decrease as you increase. May we receive your word in our hearts and put it into practice in our families and in our parenting. May you come into this place in a way we've never experienced you before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In 1884, Richard Dangdale, a New York prison warden, realized that six of the inmates were from one family. Intrigued by this phenomenon, he decided to trace down their family history and he was able to track them down to a family of a man by the name Max Jukes. Together with his wife, Max Jukes was incarcerated in prison many times because of misconduct and reverend in the streets of New York. And they decided to investigate what became of their descendants, 1,200 descendants. And they found out, out of the two boys and four girls of Max Dukes, 52.4% of all girls turned up to be prostitutes. 310 of them were paupers and homeless. 300 of them died before the age of 30. 182 alcoholics, 160 were drug addicts, 150 were incarcerated in prison for an average of 13 years each, 67 of them died of syphilis and Achilles disease, and 7 of them had committed murder. All of them from one family. During the same period in history, they decided to compare a very contrasting family of a man by the name Mark, uh, Thomas Jonathan. For those of you who are theologians or have theological interest, this is the man who preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Ugly God, the most analyzed sermon in history. And they found out, Jonathan Edward, after studying 1,400 out of their 11 children, they found out that out of those children, 1,400 of them, 66 of them became university professors, 75 either served in the army or in the navy, Another 13 of them were college president. 80 of them sold books all over the U.S. and Canada. 100 of them were attorneys, including 32 U.S. judges. And 80 of them were senior government officials, including three governors, three senators, one controller of the U.S. Treasury, and the third vice president of the U.S., Vice President Aaron Burr, who served under President Thomas Jefferson. That was 1884. I wonder what the statistics would reveal today in the year 2019. May I suggest this morning, while there is little you can do about your ancestors, there is something you can do about your descendants. A father's influence in particular goes to the fourth generation long after he's gone. This morning, brothers and sisters, precious friends, I'd like us to look at four principles on parenting today. Parenting today. Number one, understand your child. Understand your child. In the 1968 Summer Olympics, John Stephen Awari was scheduled for marathon in Mexico. On the 19th minute, he injured his knee so badly that he couldn't run. He dragged his feet to the finishing line and crossed that line about an hour and 15 minutes later after the stadium lights had gone out and the medals were already awarded. The journalist went over to him and asked him, Sir, how come you kept on running in excess of an hour and a quarter? After the medals were awarded, the stadium lights had gone out. What was your motivation? What was your driving force? What inspired you to keep on keeping on? And he looked straight into the eyes of the reporters and said, Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, when my nation, the country of Tanzania, sent me to this country thousands of miles away, they never sent me here to compare myself with the other athletes. They sent me here to finish the race. And I read a scripture to that effect long ago. I have fought the good fight of faith. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. Second Timothy 4.17. 4, I want to ask you. Is there anyone who can confess? Remember today is Sunday. You need to be honest always. But at least Sunday morning you need to be extra honest. How many can confess this morning in this holy place? One day, let's say you are driving somewhere. Let's call this town Nakuru. And you are driving your car when suddenly you noticed someone overtook you, Kimadharao. 
you got so upset you stepped on that accelerator and you passed that character and after some momentary excitement and celebration the poor character turns on the left to my mahio he wasn't headed to nakuru after all how many there is a heart there any other honest person you see i realize in the highway of life we get into the highway at different times different stages and travel at different paces at exit at different times in our lives one of the strangest and most peculiar behaviors i have found with kenyan parents all kenyan parents all kenyan parents academically speaking when they were in primary school and high school they used to be number one number two parents are in uganda i think we know that there's something else very interesting with anglican people all anglican church parents your children are well behaved the children who mislead your kids are your neighbor's children isn't it they are not taught the word of god don't you know that they have negative influence our children are well behaved so we are not doing this message because of you we are doing it because of your neighbor isn't it whenever i used to go to schools and i lost count at about 400 of them and the number one complaint i used to hear from students especially high school students mama says i'm not like my brother i'm not like my sister i'm being pushed to be an engineer like my father to run our construction farm i'm being pushed by my mom who is a magistrate to be a lawyer i want to suggest this morning god never designed these kids to be like their brother or their sister or their mother or any other role model you look out there they were created with their unique identity they are not meant to travel on the fast lane they are meant to keep on their lane your job is to help them to hear god's voice your job is to help them to hear god's voice not to coerce them to be like so and so talk to me if you can there was a master who was going on a distant land he decided to give some talents to his servants and the very first servant was given some five talents he worked very hard returned how many in total 10 and the master said well done thou good and faithful servant enter ye into the joy of the lord now the second servant was given some two talents worked very hard returned how many in total four and the master said well done thou good and faithful servant enter ye into the joy of the lord notice they were commended equally although they didn't perform equally the good lord knew he didn't give them equal talents he didn't expect equal return on his investment there is a child presented by a parent in our midst this morning who could be extremely good in academics he's a class prefect he's good in drama and music and swimming all at the same time there could be another child presented by the same parent or another parent if they attempt to do the five things i described they will flop in all five your job as a parent is to identify these talents to nurture these talents and to help this child to become their very best but now there was someone who was given one talent returned how many in total and then he began to accuse the master maybe before i continue let me make a disclaimer there could be someone in church who is wondering how come these other people know the answer do they have the preacher sermon for the benefit of those who are wondering how the rest of us know the story for the benefit of those who come to church only when there's a guest speaker this story is in matthew 25 does that help matthew is a book in the bible i hope that helps he was given one talent and he returned to one he began to accuse the master i knew you're a hard man you're like ripping where you did not sow and the master said why then didn't you give my money to kcb or equity bank or barclays bank i need to mention many banks because i need job from all of you why did you give my money to family bank i could have gotten it back with some interest you lazy wicked and unworthy servant go to hell where there is wailing and national teeth of course the bible doesn't have the word hell but talk to me if you can where do you think there is wailing and national teeth jesus this story was not given by the apostle paul this story was not given by the apostle peter this story was given by christ it was never mentioned he committed adultery it was never mentioned he murdered anyone He's anguishing in hell because he has refused to utilize his God-given talents. God gives you the gift. Your gift back to God is to make use of that talent. 
And the message you should convey to your child is this. They will be judged for the talent they don't use. And the good Lord has a very interesting mouth. He takes the one who did not use and gives it to the one who made use of that talent. You lose the talent you don't use. What you don't use, you lose and you are judged for it. That's the message we need to say to our kids. Understand them. Don't compare them. Principle number two. Train your child. Train your child. Fortunately for me this morning, it is very easy to draw the picture of a train because we have many in Kenya. And a train is nothing more but the aging of the locomotive. Anything else hooked up to the train, we call them coaches. They can be three or twenty or a hundred. The idea behind the English word train means whenever the aging moves, the coaches follow. They don't choose the direction. They are trained in a given direction. If the train turns right, they all turn right. If the train turns left, they all turn left. They don't choose the direction. They are trained in a given direction. I'll never forget hearing the story of a girl who was sent home because of smoking. Somewhere in the west of Nairobi. Not in Europe. Here in restaurants. And when the girl came back home two weeks later with her mama, her mama went into the hot bag and burned some two cigarettes. Gave the daughter one, she took one, packed the smoke to the principal, and then asked the principal, what were you talking about? Suppose you are the principal that morning. Where will you begin? In another school, a girl was given the skirt by the school as they traditionally do in that school. And the favorite girl she was, or a tree girl she was, she decided to trim it to size. The principal did what they have done since the beginning of time, sent her home to regain her sanity. She comes back to school after two weeks with her mama. The principal looks at the daughter's cat, mother's cat, daughter's cat, mother's cat. Suddenly the spirit of wisdom came upon the principal and she said, your daughter is deteriorating in academics. You tell me, where would you have started? Charity begins. What is to train? In training, you don't tell people what to do. You lead them in what to do. Fathers, if you can hear my voice, what is to train for you? If you come back home three in the morning drunk, you are telling your son, don't come home three in the morning drunk. Come at six. I've shown you the pattern. Fathers, if you can hear my voice, I'm saying this. If you are beating their mother, you are telling your son, don't leave it at the beating level. Fracture her leg. I've set the pattern for you. Fathers, if you can hear my voice, I am saying this. To train means if you are arrogant and rude to their mother, you are telling your son to disrespect women and marriage. And you will continue generation after generation of ruining marriages. In training, you don't give stories. After this service, don't tell them what I'm telling you. Lead them in what I'm telling you. It is very easy to listen to a new priest when he comes to this parish. Like now, you're listening to me as though everything I'm saying is the gospel truth. Simply because I'm new here. But if I was your priest, six months later, you stop listening to what I'm saying and you start, you start listening to my life. Children like tape recorders. They are not very keen with your lectures, but they are watching your every move. Parents tell. Good parents explain. Superior parents demonstrate. But great parents inspire. In the words of General Douglas MacArthur, a good general does not push his soldiers from behind. He leads them from in front. In the words of St. Francis of Assisi, a, preacher, a, a, a parishioner met him one day and said, Preacher, how and when should we preach? He replied in simplicity, Preach all the time. If necessary, use words. March 2013. I was invited by Lord Olex to train them for three days to the Abadeus Country Club. When we reached there, I met this tour guide right in that hotel. And he said he would want to take me for a walk. Fortunately, when they invited me, I requested whether I could go with my mercy. And this is free for all men who are married. If you're invited to go to a court place, renegotiate. Whether you can go with your wife is far warmer than duvets. When we reached there, we met this tour guide. 
My favorite documentaries are animal documentaries. He looked at my master die and said he wanted to take us for a walk. And I said, you must be kidding. Are there animals here? Of course we have giraffes and warthogs and baboons and monkeys. All sorts of antelopes. That's not my question, sir. I'm asking you, are there any cats here? Yes, we have some leopards, but don't worry. Just follow me. Now, I've got some bad news and some good news for you. I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is this. My wife, who naturally fears chameleons, was so relaxed in the walk, and her confidence was not in me. Her confidence was in a strange man. Have you ever felt insecure? <laughs> my goodness. Have you ever felt insecure? If I told her to follow me in the jungle, she could have told me where in the vehicle. But why was her confidence in a man she can't even remember his name? He knew the way. Suppose the guy told us, Mtebesa wa sawa, mkifika pari mchunge, chui wawiru na kuonga hapo na wakona watoto. Do you think we could have taken the walk? But the guy didn't point the way, he led the way. Jesus never pointed us to a place of righteousness. He pointed us to himself. One time, he stood in public and asked, can any of you prove me your sin? The apostle Paul speaking to his protege Timothy said, follow me as I follow Jesus. In that great city of Antioch, they never called themselves Christians. That's why the term was used for the very first time in history. The city dwellers observed the mannerisms of the apostles and said, they talk like Christ. They walk like Christ. They love each other like Christ. They look like Christ. They are Christ. Like they are Christians. That's where the term comes from. What is my message? If you don't want your children to do something, stop doing it. Why? Because in reality, every single parent would want to produce a CEO or a governor or a cabinet secretary or a corporate leader or a great entrepreneur. Every single parent would want to produce children of good values and morals. But you don't produce who you want. You produce who you are. Like begets like. You reproduce your type. You reproduce your kite. If there is anything you're doing that you don't want your child to duplicate, stop doing it. In fact, in my book on mentorship, which Canon will mention about later, Parenting Today, we came up with an elephant and a calf for two reasons. Parenting today is the elephant in the room. But number two, to convey one message, the calf of the elephant does not decide the path. The calf believes the mother has done the homework. The calf believes the mother has done the research. The calf believes the mother knows the green pastures and the water spots. The calf is telling the mother, don't tell me to walk right. You watch where you're walking. I'll step every place you step. I came with my two children. My name is Kenyanjui. I invite you today after this service to talk to them. They are outside. They are selling the books. They are with us in the morning service. And before you talk to them for two minutes, you will notice you are speaking to two literal Tonyanjuis. <laughs> Let me tell you one of the things that Tonyanjuis do every evening. Every evening we read one chapter of the Bible and pray together. And I began this before they were born. I will bless them right in their mother's soup. This is what I found out. The average Muslim prays five times a day. You are here praying and fasting and strategizing how to reach Muslims. And you almost go 10 years without making a single convert. Here is the deal. They go through serious indoctrination. How do you change a man who went through Madarasa? They pray five times a day. The average Jew prays three times a day. The average Christian family, Mama Ogoza Maobi. Mama Obea Chakura, shame on you. The moment you can't kneel down and pray, you are telling your son you don't believe in God. The message of salvation we read today, our first reading, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. The Bible does not say teach your children the word of God. The Bible does not say read for them the Bible. The Bible says impress. Put it as symbols in their hands, their foreheads. When I was growing up as a Christian, when we were in high school, we used to put a badge. Jesus saves. We need that old time religion. And I'm calling upon every father to be a priest at home. Go reread it again. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And this is not a suggestion. 
God speaks through Moses and says, These things I command you, impress them in your children. Even what God gave Moses at Mount Sinai, notice they are not the ten suggestions. They are the ten commandments. Principle number three. Connect with your child. And to connect means to deliberately, consciously create the time. You have time for what you value. You have time for who you value. For children, time equals love. Love equals time. Period. It is easy for you to tell me you love your wife. It is easy for me to tell me you love your children. If I really want to know who you love and what you love, I don't need your stories. I need to check two things. How you spend your money and how you spend your time. They reveal who you are. Your monetary and time decisions lay your life bare. You don't tell people you love them. For God so loved the world. So what did he do? And he came and dwelt amongst us. And the word became flesh. As we read in John 1.14. There are many reasons why Jesus came. But one core reason why Jesus came in the flesh. Is to experience our lives. He was tempted in all points as we are. Yet without sin. It is strange when I talk to parents and I ask them, why do you work so hard? If I was in a parental seminar, I would be walking around, picking your answers. For now, I'll tell you what I've heard from many people. Many people tell me this, I work very hard because of my children. Then it beats every logic to lose these kids to HIV AIDS, to lose these kids to crime, to lose these kids to drug and substance abuse. Meanwhile, you are working very hard for them. You are putting up apartments for kids who will never be there. Sometimes I hear fathers telling me, I'll pay the fees. I'll buy the books. What else do they need from me? Excuse me. Who made you Red Cross? Why would you reduce yourself from a father to a guardian and a sponsor? Why would you reduce yourself from the highest title to a mere sponsor? And if you have paid the fees, never talk about it. That's the indivisible minimum that everyone is doing. Everyone else whose children are in school has paid the school fees. This child needs you. Here is my message for us. Right now, all your phones are silent. That doesn't mean Safaricom has closed down shops. They are silent on purpose. After this service, you are likely to return calls of those who are looking for you in the priority of how much you honor them. You have time for who you love. You have time for what you love. A dear friend of mine was kajaked and taken to Gong Hills. He was driving a four-wheel. And these guys didn't believe he didn't have cash. Like many of you today, he believes in plastic money. The abductors became so upset and they said, we're going to finish you. But before doing that, we will give you our phone. Make your last call. Make your last call. Make your last call. Ask your neighbor, who do you think he called? Who do you think he called? Talk to me. Who do you think he called? The wife. What do you think was the message? Lori ya mawe imefika. Kure tunajeka siyo kimau. Unajua kuna report mdose anataka ipatikane leo. Was that the message? If you really don't know what are your priorities, pretend to be in that context. The late Steve Jobs, the proprietor, the brain behind Apples. I think the greatest lesson I picked from him was this. He said almost his entire working class, he used to wake up in the morning, go to the mirror and ask himself one question. If today were my last day in life, would I do what I'm about to do? And when the answer was no, for far too many days in a row, I knew there was something I needed to change. By the time he died, President Nelson Mandela was by far the greatest icon on the planet. Many historians believe his record smashed that of Mahatma Gali, Martin Luther King Jr., and other icons. I have deep honor and respect for him. I think I have quoted him than any other personality in my books. But sometimes I wonder, having spent 27 years at that notorious Robin Island jail, having broken his marriage, having lost his three children, three of his children, to HIV AIDS, is it possible? Is it possible? He may have questioned 
his priorities? Is it possible he may have wondered deep down his heart in the privacy of his thoughts? If I needed to save a great nation from the forces of apartheid and by extension humanity at large, just, maybe, just, maybe I didn't need to raise a family. I don't know the answer. I leave you to be the judge. But I wonder how many in this congregation would want to reach the top of their career to be the greatest entrepreneur and then lose your children to HIV AIDS, lose your children to a bullet, lose your children to crime. I wonder how rewarding that would be. For me, if my precious mercy walked out on me because of misconduct, if my son Zig, my daughter Ivy, one day challenged me, if dad you are only there for us like you are there for many other people, maybe we wouldn't be in alcohol today. Maybe we wouldn't be so frustrated today. Maybe we would not be in tears today. I would be one more broken hearted father. I would consider myself a failure as a husband. And never again in my life would I stand before people to speak what I'm so passionate about. For me, true success is when those closest to me love and respect me the most. How often we wear images out there looking good to the whole world. Only your family knows you are a disaster. And that's what Mother Teresa said. If you want to change the world, if I may quote her, go home and love your family. Even for the clergy in our midst and ministers of the word of God, God will never compromise your family for the sake of his family. God doesn't do that. Because the blessings of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. Please, if you feel like leaving this service, you are allowed to do so. It's not likely to get any better. You have time for what you love. You have time for who you love. The priorities are in your hands. Children need your presence, not your presence. You can't bribe your way into fatherhood, into motherhood. It's not a privilege you're doing your children to demand them to pay back. It's a responsibility you cannot delegate. On her deathbed, Professor Wagari Madai was quoted by the Daily Nation saying, The only thing I regret is that I never spent ample time with my own children. I quote her because this was in the public domain, conscious she could be having friends or relatives here. This is the only Nobel laureate from the nation of Kenya, and maybe you have a secret desire to be a Nobel laureate one day. If, if I may paraphrase the good professor, she's telling us from her deathbed, I learned a little bit too late, parental responsibilities cannot be delegated. You can't pick it up from where you left. Once a child outgrows a certain face in life, it's gone. If you didn't play with them before they were the age of seven. If you are not with them when they were preteens, right now you know what I'm saying. Some of you I'm touching raw nerves. Because there could be a parent listening to me. And the child has been going in and out of prison. There could be a parent listening to me. And their kids now are struggling with drugs. There could be parents listening to me. And their kids cannot come to church. They don't believe in your God. Principle number four. And the last one. I would have preferred to share with you 12 principles. Time can't allow me. The message I'm giving you right now. It's in this little book called Paradigm Shifting Parenting. We have a few copies at that tent. Paradigm Shifting Parenting. You can read all the 12 principles in this book. And because time will not allow me to give you all the 12 principles, Canon Kabiro has allowed me to take you through a program called Parenting Today for 10 weeks, starting 28th of July, of, of May, sorry. 20th of May, that is every Tuesday, 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. I've done this program different corners of the world. It has 10 chapters. The first one is mentorship. The second one is talents. How to identify the talents in your child and link them with your career. The third one is sexuality. And the reason we have this lesson, I want to ask you, is it possible there is a young adult or a preteen presented by a parent here, today alone they will be exposed to sexual explicit materials. For example, they advertise in Nivea and they bring a picture of a naked woman. Is that possible? And how many times in a year do you talk to your child about sexuality? Give me a number. Maybe once or twice. Some of you, none. 
If you are speaking two, three times a year, and the media is doing it every single day, by law of averages, who is going to win? That's why we have that topic. Topic for gadgets. Many of you right now are confused. How do we deal with the phones, the internet? Lesson five, time. Lesson six, discipline. Lesson seven, communication. Lesson eight, needs. Lesson nine, resilience. And lesson ten, family. This is about the single parents, the nuclear families, extended families, and blended families. We have other books. I may not have time to explain all of them. For those of you who are keen with repositioning themselves in the corporate world and strategic thinking, I have a book called Reposition Yourself. For those of you keen in identifying the gifts and the talents in your kids, I have a book called Blue Sky Strategy. For those of you in business, I have a book called You Don't Need a Job. If you're employed, please avoid this book. I'm a writer. If you resign, I'm not responsible. We have a few copies there. Lesson number four and the last one. Bless your children. Words are never neutral. We read in James 3 verse 1 through 12. How strange it is we use the same tongue to bless and the same tongue to curse. And the Bible asks us a question. Can bitter and sweet water come from the same spring? Bone blind, deaf and dumb. Helen Keller, when she learned how to speak, she eloquently said it this way. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will break my heart. And I believe there's some validity to that observation because my mom had a brother. They named him Moreu. In my mother tongue, the name means the drunkard. True to his word, true to his name, rather, he drank Changa every single day. He actually died on a trench. When he finally kicked the bucket, we didn't deem it necessary to do a post-mortem to investigate into the causes of his death. His name sealed his fate. Of all names, there's a school in Yamira County. They called it Nyakimincha High School. Translated in the Guzi language, the tail. And the school has never disappointed. <laughs> KCSC after KCSC, the tail. There's a school next to Nyakimincha. They called it Nyakoiba High School. Translation, the thief. 2015, when the students lacked anything to steal, they stood examination and all results for all students were cancelled. Between Kakamega and Bugoma, there is a school they named Ebuchinga. In fact, in some, in some lawyer directs pronounced Ebuchinga translation, the place of fools. No further comment. There's a school in Nyeri County, they called it Kiagoma High School. Translation, the Devil's High School. You should have seen those boys on rampage graciously four years ago. They renamed it to Mukurene High School. By far the largest tribe in Ghana is known as the Ashanti tribe. They have a unique way of naming their children. They name them after the day of the week in which the child is born. The children born on Monday have a given middle name, Akwasi, translated in the Ashanti language to mean kind, generous, peace-loving, godly. Either by coincidence or otherwise, almost 80% of all clergy, Christian missionaries, government leaders, senior government officials, serious entrepreneurs and corporate leaders in Ghana are the Akwasis. The children born on Wednesday have a given middle name, Akwaku. Translated in the Ashanti language to mean, mean, rough, arrogant, terrible. Guess what? Government statistics reveal that over 75% of all crime in Ghana is committed, guess by who? Akwakus. The power in a name. You get a restaurant and call it Karumaito Bar. And you wonder why visitors don't come there. Who wants to finish his shop, his money in your shop? There's a friend of mine by the name Dr. Mary Okello. One day she invited me to speak in our school and I took advantage to ask her the secret of her family success. To refresh your memory, her elder brother Moody Awori was the ninth vice president of Kenya. Her younger brother Agri Awori was the minister of information communication in Uganda. Her brother Dennis Awori, a long-serving chair at Toyota. Huntington Awori, long-serving chair KQ. Professor Nelson Awori, the first doctor to conduct a successful kidney transplant on African soil, the facility in Upper Hill opposite uh, Nairobi Hospital 
is named in his honor. Judy Wakungu, current ambassador of France. Jeremy Awori, current CEO of Barclays Bank. Kwedo Opanga, Mary Okero herself with her late husband, are the proud owners of McKinney Group of School. And Dr. Mary Okero was the first woman to be a bank branch manager in Kenya. The first woman in Africa to speak in Harvard School of Business. Edon, Edon, I have not even scratched the surface about this family and their levels of success. So I asked Dr. Mary Okero, and maybe there's even one of their relatives in our midst, I asked her, what is the secret of the Awari family? Listen at her response. Doc, my dad, Canon Jeremiah Awari, was an Anglican clergyman, and every single day he blessed us. Every single day he blessed us. He's the secret of what you're seeing in the Awari family today. When my kids were little, I knelt by their bedside and every single day blessed them. When they became big, we read the Bible together daily. The blessings you receive here from the priest, I speak them in my house daily. When we speak to prisoners, they tell us the same thing. I'm exactly where my mom said I'm going to be. As I was growing up, mama said, you are jail material. Here I am as mama perfectly said it. There were two Johns and they were classmates. For your comfort, this is the last story. One was known as the bad John. So named because he bullied the other kids in class. Never did his homework in time. Was arrogant with the teachers. And needless to tell you, was the last child in academics. But in the self-same class was a contrasting John. They nicknamed him the good John. So named because he assisted the other kids with their homework, was loved by the teachers, was the class prefect and the top child in academics. One beautiful afternoon, the mother of the bar John, bar John, bar John, the mother of the bar John came to school. The teacher on duty reasoned very fast and thought there is no way the mother of the bar John can come to embarrass herself in school. Of necessity, therefore, this must be the mother of the good John. In the midst of that confusion, identity confusion, the teacher began to speak to the mother. Your John is such a delightful land to have in class. The darling of the students, the favorite of the teachers, the don't, don't, don't. The teacher spoke in such glowing terms. Never before had the mother had any kind word about her journey. But mothers are strange people. And I thank God there is Mother's Day. And today is Mother's Day. Mothers love us for who we are. Let's face it. Father's love is a little bit negotiable. It is sometimes premised on performance and how much money you take home. But mothers love you, whether you are a creep or not, whether you are thief or not, whether you make it in life or not. Mother's love is like God's love. It's unconditional. A hand clap for mothers. <laughs> the mother believed the message and went to the son. For the first time, boy, I've had good news about you. Son, if you continue with this attitude, you're going to achieve your dreams in life. Son, if you continue with this attitude, you are unstoppable. The mother spoke and spoke and spoke. Remember only one teacher spoke. Mothers have a way of amplifying voice. The mother didn't say the teacher said. The mother said the teachers are saying. You have improved dramatically. Unbelievable as it might sound your intelligent ears. An average D student in just a single semester ended up as a C student. Finally when he sat for his 12th grade equivalent of form for here in Kenya. He was not only the top child that year, but the top child in the entire history of that school. Although the teacher accidentally motivated him. I gave you that story in such many details to say this. The spoken word, whether intentionally spoken or accidentally spoken, will have the same result. There's nothing like the threat of the tongue. There's an Arabian proverb that says, four things never come back. The spared arrow. The neglected opportunity, the past life, and the spoken word. The Bible says thou shalt not curse a deaf person. Why is such a scripture? Leviticus 19.14. Deaf people cannot even hear. It is because of the damage those words will do 
as the vessels told in those words. The Bible says, life and death is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit they are love. Proverbs 18.21 Life and death. By the way, the story of Mr. Escalante in your own time, you can go and Google that movie. That story has been used to teach teachers to speak positively to students all over the U.S. They have now converted it even to a movie. You can go search in your own time. Mr. Escalante. I want to pray for you. And the prayers I'm going to make in this place will have an impact in you and your family for the rest of your life. One day I was preaching in London. I made an altar call and a couple of people came. But I noticed a white man in his early 60s who was in tears. I went down there and asked him what is going on. And he said, I think all along you're preaching to me. And I kept telling my son, he read up in jail. And now, Mr. Preacher, sir, as I speak to you today, my son is serving his seventh year in jail. And that's why I will not leave here until we break every curse spoken of our families in our past. Here is the deal. You see, the chief of general staff came to Jesus and said, one of my officers is unwell. Jesus knew. Give honor to the one honor is due. So Jesus knew this is a great man who needs honor. Jesus said, I will come to your house. Pray over him. The centurion said, no, 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 no. I understand how things work. I'm a general. I speak a word. Bullets are fired in the battleground. Jesus, I know who you are. Just say the word. Just say the word. And sickness will leave. Just say the word. And my servant will be well. Just say the word. You know what the centurion understood? Every word from Jesus activates the Egeric ram into action. Every positive word you speak, you speak life. It will cause heaven to back you. Every negative word you speak, activate the demonic ram into action. If you live with someone who keeps telling you, he will kill you one of these days. Leave that house. There will be a demon who will do a thorough homework on that assignment. Do you know why I'm saying this? The devil cannot read your mind. He gets hints, cues and clues when you speak. He can't read your mind. That's why Jesus taught us, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed from here and planted into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. Jesus never said, does not doubt in his mind. Why? We are human. You are likely to doubt in your mind. But when you speak it, you transfer it to your heart. So I charge you today, don't say things as they are. Say things as they ought to be. Talk to me if you can. The Bible says, let the weak say, now, God cannot lie. He has no capacity to lie. If God can tell the weak to say, I'm strong, then I submit that the Bible is consistent. God calls things that are not as though they are. So today, if your husband is not in church, I realize when Canon said mothers to stand up, almost the quarter of our mothers. If your husband is not in church, stop gossiping your husband with other women. Misery loves company. Stop discussing your husband with other women. And start speaking that your husband is good. He may be drunk, but he comes home at least. He may be drunk, but you have a husband at least. Others don't have him. Don't say things as they are. Say things as they ought to be. If your child is not doing it in academics, don't confess it. Confession breeds possession. My daughter Ivy in class one failed in all subjects. At one of them, she failed successfully. She got zero out of 50 in Kiswahili. Zero out of 50. Zero is a strange number. It doesn't matter how much you multiply it with. It still gives you zero. So she got zero percent. I was busy inspiring others. My daughter is with zero percent. How do you inspire others with a zero in your house? We look for a tuition teacher. How do you get a tuition teacher for a class one child? I talked to this lady for about an hour. Don't label the child. Just teach these things I don't understand. Teach gaily. Don't label the child at all. Six years later, in class six, first term. She was the top child in her school, Loretta Msogari. She was the top child in a two-stream school and she was number one also in Kiswahili. Now, don't say, don't, if you continue to call Mtoto Ewe Ngombe Sana, in two weeks, they will depict Ngombe characteristics. Are you with me? Don't say things as they are. Say things as they ought to be. Now, I want to pray and this is what I want us to do. I don't want to create any emotion. 
I want you to be very sober. Very sober. I'll be requesting you to stand in a moment. And I want to pray for three categories of people. If a father or a mother spoke cursing words to you, whether they are alive or dead, Jesus became a curse that you may become blessed of God. Galatians 3.13 one reason you come to church is to walk out of that church without your burdens. If he said you will never get married, you will never get children, you will never succeed, you will be a misery. If such words are spoken by a parent, this is the last day you are carrying that burden. Category number two. If you have spoken careless words to your children, you are foolish, you are stupid, you will never make it. You have spoken such words. The Bible says in the times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. If you have spoken such words to your children, I want you to come for repentance. And number three, if you have cast yourself, I'll never get married. I'm always prayed by men. I'm always broke. I always get fired. You have spoken casting words to yourself. I also want to find your way forward. Kneel down if you can. Each one of us, let's stand. Let's stand. Now, if I've described you, come forward as quickly as you can. We have only... We have, we have passed our time. If I've described you, come forward. If you're able to kneel down, kneel down. If you can't, you stand. If words, casting words are spoken to you, or you've spoken such words to your kids, all, you have cast yourself. I want you to come forward, and I want us to trust God together to bless you and your household. I'll give you just a minute, and then I make that prayer. And I'll request the choir maybe to do for us one song as we give them that. If you're able to kneel down, please kneel down. If you can't, please turn. Facing the altar. Did you know, do you know the song that says the Lion of Judah has broken every chain? Do you know it? Jesus became a curse that we may become blessed of God. Do not leave this church carrying the burdens of what's spoken over us. Yes, please, choir. Choir, please, hold on. There's a song there. The land of Judah has broken every chain. Who has put it? Is there anyone who can lead us in that song? Anyone who knows it? Yes, there's a lady there. Please, go ahead. Let's all make that confession. Make that confession. Make that confession. Let's pray. Our gracious Savior, we come in this altar by faith. We thank you for the gift of life and the gift of salvation. There are many people who never lived to see this day. They died before they were 10, they died before they were 20, they died before they were 40. But God, you've kept us alive to this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of health. Much was spoken against us, but you ruled it out of order on the cross. You became cursed on the cross that we may become the blessed of God. And now, Lord, I stand on this altar as your servant to break every curse spoken over our lives. In the name of Jesus, we break every barrenness, physical or material. In the name of Jesus, we refuse poverty is not our portion. A life of struggle is not our portion. We refuse it this morning. In the name of Jesus. We break all the chains that were spoken against us. We cancel every negative statement. And today we confess we are blessed. We are blessed in the city and blessed in the countryside. We are blessed in our places of work. We are blessed in our businesses. In the name of Jesus. 
that which God has blessed cannot be cast. And I seal every family here with the precious blood of Jesus. Victory is their portion. Victory is their inheritance. We repent every negative word we have spoken against our children. Lord, would you graciously forgive us. And now we open our mouths and declare, Our children are blessed. Mighty in the land are the children of the righteous. They shall be the head and never the tail. Right in their primary schools, in high schools, in colleges and universities. In their young adults, protect them from alcohol. Protect them from sexual promiscuity. Protect them from the sins of their fathers. In the name of Jesus. None of our children will be lost. None of them will die prematurely. They will live in the land of the living. To see the greatness of their God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh Jehovah God. We bless our families before you. We bless our families before you. We will live to see our children's children. To the fourth generation. In the name of Jesus. No sickness will before us. No poverty will touch us. We will prosper because you are, we are your children. You said you came that we may have life. And have it more abundantly. As we are praying. Is there anyone who wants to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? Anyone in this congregation who don't make that decision that I made when I was in class 7. And you are saying I think I need to connect with Christ today. I have been coming to church. But I have not made this prayer. Anyone who would want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, lift up your head. We want to pray for you right now. Anyone who is not born again, and you want to make that prayer. That you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. This is your moment. This is your day. This is your hour. Anyone like that? The rest of us, I want you to open your eyes and look at me. When you go back, if you have spoken a negative word against your child, lay your right hand on that child and tell him, I'm sorry, I spoke what I spoke based on what I knew, but now I'm blessing you. If they don't live with you, if they are out of town or they live abroad, make a phone call today and make a prayer as they listen. The Jewish people bless their sons and daughters every morning. By laying their right hand on them. In that case, you invoke God's blessings to be their covering wherever they go. If someone spoke a word against you when you're growing up, listen to this. It's defeated. It's in your past. It will never follow you as long as you live. So I want you to say this after me. I am blessed. The fruit of my womb is blessed. My children are blessed. The work of my hands is blessed. My future is blessed in Jesus' name. The rest of the congregation, do you believe you are blessed? Can you also confess the same? Say you are blessed and I cannot be cursed. My business is blessed. It will prosper even when the economy is crashing. My children will succeed wherever they go because blessing is my portion. In Jesus' name. Do you believe it? Yes. I have a book about the power of the spoken word. In case you don't have this copy, I've shown you how to break these curses. And it has a chapter on how to bless your children. It has one chapter on how to bless yourself. It's called the power of self-talk. If you're able to get these copies, the Lord bless you. Come on. <laughs> Would you come and dismiss us?